A session on certification of electric aircraft, and that's exactly what we were talking about right now. So thank you very much again. And uh, may now the speakers of the next, bye bye. And may now the speakers of the next session switch on their videos. Um, I stay on and uh, yeah, that's about it. So it would be our first speaker of the next session is uh, Sebastian Reschenhofer, uh, who is speaking for EuroK. Um, and what is your okay he will explain uh, but you know especially in the collaboration with the asa so with the european certification they are very important um and so i would say uh the stage is yours sebastian it's the first time that you present at the e forum and i hope you like it and i hope you come back thank you very much thanks willy i hope you can hear me okay I will uh, yes, share. I hear you. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe change your show your screen. Yes, yes. Um, let me share. Sorry. Yes, okay. it's coming. Yes, it's not a pre presentation. Now you have the mo ah. That's it. Perfect. Okay. I switch my mic off. I see you. Talk to you later. Okay. Thanks. Thanks again. Uh, Hello, my name is Sebastian Reschnover. I'm the technical program manager at EuroK for the working group 112 on VTOL. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk a bit about EuroK and our standardization activity craft. I will begin with a brief introduction of EuroK. Um, it's an acronym for the European Organization of Civil Aviation Equipment. We are an independent non-for-profit organization founded in 1963 in Switzerland and Lucerne by the by ICAC. Uh, we are fully dedicated to aviation standardizations and we have a long standing successful record in high quality and safety, criti safety critical standardization. Our whole team, my, my colleagues, our governing structure, the TAC Council, we are all dedicated to serve our members and, of course, to the global aviation community. Uh, some facts and figures we are currently having around 400 members in and 50 active working groups working on different topics. Uh, over 4,500 experts are, are in the groups writing the standards. Um, you see on the pie chart that 42% of the members are international members. Uh, this is a very uh, important point for us. Although the name says Euro, we are an international organization. We are European based, but we are not limited to the EU or to the continental Europe. So it's an international uh, organization based in Europe. We have global coordination with ICAO, with other standards development organizations. We are recognized by ICAO as an international standards development organization. We are at the standards roundtable and we are also listed at the uh, a standards development organization at the World Trade Organization. And we, we share a, a number of groups together with, with our partners in, in the US. This was a quick info about EuroK, now coming to our working group 112 and VTOL. Um, it started in June 2019. We had together a, a workshop here in, in, in Paris with EASA on, on the need for, for standards development for VTOL aircraft. Uh, the meeting concluded in course, of course, uh, for, for a need, and we kicked off the, the working group at the same month in the end of June. Currently, there are around 25 standards in development, and we have international participation. So currently, there are 500 plus experts registered. Uh, we have a huge increase over the last years. For example, we had the workshop uh, was with around 80 participants. So in the last year, in the last two years, we had, we had quite a, a huge growth and there's still, still a demand. The members are, of course, industry, VTOL OEMs, but also airlines, airports, uh, air traffic management organizations, R&D organizations, also individuals supporting VTOL standardization. Uh, various institutions, also from the Asian Pacific area, we have the Kiosk and Tekari from, from Korea. We have uh, AIDA from Japan, the German Aerospace Center from ELA from Germany. 
uh, an important uh, sorry for interruption, uh, Sebastian. Sorry, very sorry for interruption. Can you get a little bit closer to the microphone? People have oh, difficulty sorry. hearing you. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. Is it is it better now? Oh, better Let here. Thank you. Let me see if I have selected the right one. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me better like this? A little better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, sorry for that. Sorry for that. Um, okay. Back then, the authorities. Um, of course, EASA is a big partner here. I have some some slides on it later, but also uh, national CAs. Uh, you see, UK, France, New Zealand, the FAA, Singapore, and Transport Canada uh, are in the group and and supporting our activities activities, which is which is really good. Um, the working group structure is as follows. So we have the, the overall plenary uh, with our co-chairs, Oliver Reinhardt and Lionel Wallace from Volocopt and Lilium. The secretary is, is, is held by Euroke, uh, myself as a secretary. The general coordination is ensured, is ensured through a, a steering committee, which consists out of Euroke members, EASA, of course, the working group and the subgroup leadership. The standards development is then done in eight subgroups. We started with five, now we have eight. So again, there is a huge demand and increase in the, in the topics. Uh, we have electrical systems, lift thrust, safety, flight, ground, avionics, conops, and seats groups, which is joined with SAE. Um, a quick excursus to the regu regulatory side. Uh, you might all know that EASA issued a special condition in July, 2019, so similar to the uh, um, launch of our working group, the special condition was published. Uh, it is based on you know, CS 23 and 27, but also some special retail requirements. And it is more an object objective based certification. So the flexibility to uh, certify all of the different uh, designs we've seen from the other presentations. And for the means of compliance of the special conditions, there are some of EASA and uh, this is where we come into the into the equation, also industry standards, where we teamed up with the ASA. So the UK 112 is is um, making standards is exclusively for the for the SC, to support the SCV tool. Uh, this is done in so-called MOC priorities uh, with three phases. Uh, the first phase is already released, I think, on the EASA website. Uh, MOC phase two was in commenting period and will be released in early 2022. The first document, ED289, is already referenced there, which is a, a great success for us. Uh, the phase three is currently being defined uh, and coordinated with EASA and, and the steering committee. So there will be for sure some new um, standards development uh, being launched in the, in the near future. A quick uh, overview, I won't go into detail here, but uh, you can see the, the various DPs. The green ones are the published ones. Yellow is um, currently in comment resolving period. So they've completed open consultation. Um, so there's quite a lot of going on. Maybe one highlight to mention is the ED299, a guidance for vertiport operations. This document, will be launched for open consultation uh, probably tomorrow. So if you want to review the, the standard, please feel free. There's free registrations on our website. You can review the standard, provide comments on it. We only need your email to come back to you in case we have any questions. Uh, but please feel free to, to support this here. We have also introduced a new way of working, the so-called lean process, uh, just for working group 112. The main reason was to try to keep the um, administrative effort a bit simpler. Um, we are using common sense as a driver to support this rapid development. Um, it should be always consensus based. Uh, as I said, we wanted to gain time and, and flexibility for the working group to minimize the, the, the efforts on an administrative level. Of course, our main principles openness transparency and consensus are still yeah very important for us so we are not not compromising quality by by time 
So we want to deliver high quality standards, of course. Um, but of coming with consensus, this phrase good enough and done is better than perfect and pending is, is always quite a, a nice thing to say to the group. So there must it's not needed that everything is perfect. Sometimes it's better to publish something, get feedback at the open consultation and, and adapt if necessary. The main, I won't go into the detail, but we've shifted some, some um, decision making to the secretariat uh, which and to the working group, which makes it easier to approve task sheets and documents so that the group can be quite flexible in, in launching new activities, which is uh, needed here for this new construct of, of, of VTOL. As a conclusion, of course, the industry authority cooperation here is essential to get the common understanding of what is needed to ensure that the industry and the authority, uh, yeah, we have that we that we we can ensure together that there's a way ahead. I think no one can with work without the other. So we want to have safe operations and, and good resolutions to support all of all of the concepts and. We are also want to shape the standards together with, with you, this by the community, for the community. Uh, the, the industry is writing the standards with support of the regulator. This is uh, a very good opportunity here. And we want to support VTOL certification and operations in Europe and of course, beyond of Europe as well. Thank you very much. Um, if you want some further information about EuroK or about our activities, feel free to reach out to us at any social media channel. And yeah, thanks again thank for the opportunity to, to speak here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And um, I think this gives us a very nice overview that there are much more people working behind uh, getting eVTOL into the air than just the manufacturers. And, uh, and the, uh, we also see, like we will see with the manufacturers now with the presenters, we, we can see that we have uh, in different countries, different continents, different solutions. Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Howe from the CAAC Research Institute. And he will give us um, a point of view of the regulations from the Chinese side, Dr. Howe. I think uh, you sh uh, you should come to the stage. Sure, yes, sure, really. Yeah, yeah here I'm you here. are. Okay. Thank, Thank you me. very much, and I uh, leave the stage for you. I do you have slide uh, mode uh, in the presentation mode? So. Also, I'm with Beijing's Zhang Shuguang professor. Uh, we're together. Professor Zhang Shuguang from Beijing Aerospace University, and uh, we had um, we worked on it all together. First of all, let me introduce um, our, com our institution. We are a direct um, organization under CAAC and uh, the airworthiness division require us to have a research on the certification of UAV and also the standard of UAV airworthiness and as well as the registration of UAV. So uh, the airworthiness division of CAAV also has a branch and uh, which also initiate on the topic of the research of the certification of UAV and uh, we have the uh, R&D and also trial validation. These are some of the certification projects. For example, uh, the eVTOL UAV from Tianyu, and uh, we also um, participate in the certification project. Now let's Now I'll introduce some of my research. Oh. I think you are familiar with the objective of my society and there can be three stages or three types. 
of the objects, of the objectives. And Rishan is under the examination, and the next year it may be licensed and certified. So traditionally, we have the engines fueled by the um, gas uh, petroleum, but we want to electrify that. And we have the electric control system coupled with the other systems. So for the UAVs, I think autonomy is kind of difficult, but going forward, we will have quick um, further progress. So there can be three layers. And also different issues arise from different layers. So first for the electric power system, the structures, different structures have different certifications. And the second issue is about the certification of the distributed control and the power systems. The third one is the certification for the remote controlling, the remote sense systems. And based on the standards of the CAAC or the International Aviation Society, this is the questions they are researching on. And we have independent chapters dedicated to different parts of the UAVs, but we yet have yet to set the chapters for the power batteries. And we are also now seeing the provisions and the conditions for the use of part of the battery batteries. And also we have the independent conditions for the use of EH216S. And currently for the Fiat car used lithium battery, we have four research. However, for the aviation lithium battery, um, according to the previous speakers of CATL, the aviations and the cars are kind of different in the lithium batteries in the in their rationales according to my understanding the working condition for the car used battery is different from the aviation because the aviation have different stages and they have the fixed wings they have the vertical flight and the vertical takeoff and the landing so their working surface are kind of different. And also they have different heat rationales. And we have the instant and also the power output and the cars and the planes are also different in the rationales. So we may have different safety requirements for the two vehicles. And we also needed to solve the problems. Accordingly, according to different requirements, we should meet the requirements. And this is also relevant to the research of the wings and the rationale. We also have the ideas about the certification of the EVTO. As mentioned by the speakers from EuroK, YASA, and other societies have different concepts and a definition of the conditions. We also have the synchronized accreditation by NC and CORA for the certification issues. 
what is at the core is the distributed power system and the coupling of the control system. Uh, experts, are, I think, are very familiar with the features of the Evito and the strong coupling is very important. And we pay attention to the out of control and the other safety issues. So we may research on their features of non-controlling. So this part has been talked already. So this slide shows that in different working conditions and at different stages, If we have failure in part of the procedures, we need the compensation. And we also have the safety requirement for the structure. I will also talk about the certification of the UAV. Today we have with us the speakers from the corporate world who talks about the certification and they also put forward their expectations and ideas. The certification department of CEAC are also soliciting opinions from the public and they have the provisions and ideas for the safeties and the procedures. So both these two documents focus on the safety. I think the manned and unmanned planes are prioritizing the risk certifications and the risk certification has been more and more important in the whole process. We have the different certification process for different vehicles for example, for the UAVs, we have certification perspectives on these trains, the ground stations, controlling stations, and also the uh, radiation receiving stations. So these are the types being certified and we have solicited more than 200 opinions. We are responding to them one by one. Then a brief introduction to our practice of certification on the international stage. We are part of the APEL, ACAS expert committee. We are amending the appendix eight and for the unmanned system brochure amendment, we are also part of the work. Some of the amendment is going to take effect. We are also cooperating with the other working groups for the um, certification of the UAVs and we are cooperating with the partners from the New Zealand, Japan, and Malaysia. And we're also working with the other partners for the air traffic management. Paris was also mentioned by some of the speakers. My colleague Wang Chu is also one of the certification experts for the working group of JARIS. And we're also part of some other standardized standardization working group and the committee. So this is the public accounts of WeChat. One is the certification department. The other one is our own department. 
and you can go to the WeChat account to know more updates. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, how and uh, it's really uh, very interesting to see how there you're working on the same subject, but there are sometimes different approaches, but uh, especially the um, authorities like EASA, CAC, and FAA, they have slightly different approaches, but they are uh, going very well coordinated. So I think that's a very interesting point to see. And that makes me hope that we really can uh, see that the certification of the EV tolls will be faster than certification of conventional aircraft has been in the past. A lot of steps has taken in the right direction. And um, we, uh, when we talk about certification, then one thing is clear, all these EV tolls must be commercial aircraft. If they are commercial aircraft, they must have um, um, as a, a production organization, approval and the design organization approval of the authority which is responsible and also the suppliers must have this and one of the most difficult point will be probably certification of software and that's where we have our next speakers um, Andreas Pistek from the company ITK. ITK is a Bosch subsidiary which is working exactly in this field. And I think Andreas can explain this much better than me. Andreas, uh, could you uh, uh, first, uh, I think you're unmuted, perfect. So if you share your screen, uh, then we could uh, definitely come. Hello, Willy, thanks for having me here. I hope it's working. I'm just sharing my screen here. Do you see my slides now, I hope? Yes, it is in per presentation mode, perfect. Wonderful, thank you. Yes. So, ni hao and hello world from my side. As Willy said, we are a member of the Bosch Group. We are providing software and system development services for our customers also in the aviation industry. And I'm a lead engineer aerospace at ITK. As you heard, my Chinese is, well, it's in the, in the prototype stage. <laughs> I have to still work on that. And to get it on the English proficiency that I have, it's, it will require much work. And uh, that's what this short presentation is about. Um, it's hard work to get from a prototype to a certifiable flying software. So I want to pre present some short information how this step can be made easier for you. First of all, we have to take a look at what is a prototype and what is certifiable software. Many of you are really right now using prototype software and are aiming for certifiable software. If we think of prototype software as something really the well simplest approach of it um, it's really just your brain and the code you have an idea you put it to the code and it's on the machine and running that's your prototype whereas certifiable software is something different i think of it as a package it's software that behaves as intended so what does intention mean? Again, intention is your brain again, your ideas, but they need to be in a structured format. So you write them down, structural breakdown and do architecture and you write the functionality as requirements. And then at some point, once you have had several levels of that, you're writing your requirements, uh, you're writing your code and then you're compiling it and it's running on the machine. But that's not sufficient for your for your certification authority. They want more. They want to know that it behaves as intended. So you have to add your reviews, tests, analysis, and do all the verification stuff. But still, we need to have the whole package here, right? It needs to be repeatable. So we are adding plans. We are adding standards, guidelines, templates, tools. 
And then we can say, okay, now we have sort of a certifiable software package. I know there is much more, but we <laughs> try to keep it simple here. So if we compare those two, there's a border between left and right. Initially, I thought of putting that border more to the left because the effort is really, 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 really different. So, but anyways, for the sake of uh, viewing it to you, I had to do it that way. And if it comes to the bottom line, what's the real difference? With the prototype, we don't have any rules. It's just the prototype you just created. And with the certifiable software, you have rules. You have to use a V-model approach. You have to use the acceptable means of compliance. If you're going into transport, uh, with your aircraft and you have to use the respective documents. So you have to use ED12C or DO178C and the respective supplements. So early on we heard from Mr. Reschenhofer from EuroK. So the ED12C is the version, version sold by EuroK and DO178C is the version sold by RTCA because the document was created by a joint co committee. So we have to really apply those documents. And if we take a look at now which one of those is understandable and recreatable and even changeable, then we have to admit on the left side, it's only the creator that can do that. And on the right side, the ideal goal is that this can be done even in 5,000 years by literate and logical thinking human beings. It's a bit of an exaggeration here, but that's the mindset that we have to go for, for certifiable software. So if we take a deeper look now on that topic, um, the stage prototype is, as I said, it's your brain and your code. It's really the worst case. Um, and we have a mindset that goes like anything goes. We can do everything. We are free. The, the employees feel like, okay, they can do everything. There are no rules. Okay, some tend to arise, but it's just the really the extreme that I want to show here. Whereas certifiable software is something that you have to, you're only allowed to do what you're supposed to do. Yeah, you, you have strict rules that you have to follow. You have to create those documents. You have to do the tool qualification, create all the requirements model, source code, objects, whatever me method you're using, and then you have, have, to, have to do baselines. And with these baselines, we do the reviews. And once we do do the reviews, we figure out, oh, we get loads of open issues there that are arising now and we need to fix those. So we do those fixings and then we again, again, again repeat the process. And we do open problem report assessment, change control board meetings, and in the end, hopefully, we are able to submit this software accomplishment summary. And of course, there's also the certification authorities involved who will do audits and will certify your stuff in the end, your software that will be running on your aircraft. So there's a really huge difference between prototype software and certifiable software if we look at it from that perspective. So now go back to our prototype stage and imagine your company, um, you have to do some changes in your code and well, unfortunately your chief engineer is on holiday. So somebody else is looking at the code and first it looks good, but then it's changing. What's that now? So code looks like, well, it looks nice, but could this be Stonehenge? Um, so this is a reference to a book I like very much, The Mythical Man Month, about software engineering. It's pretty old, but it states that Stonehenge is possibly the biggest undocumented computer in the world. So you have maybe made your own Stonehenge there. You get code and you don't know what it's doing and why is it doing that? And well, think of maybe we should avoid that somehow and do something here in the prototype stage to avoid that, which will also help us to get to certification faster. Um, 
because at, at some point the certification process will kick in and you have to create all those do documents. So, so what can we do here? We, we have to change from an anything goes mode to a mode with some expectations. So the expectations are, for example, comment the code, put in some why we, do, we are doing it and what we are doing. Um, train your engineers on that stuff, work with them together, not just tell them to do it, but just read through it and try to use that approach. And also algorithms. When we are in prototyping stage, we tend to write down things pretty fast. And with commenting, we also should make sure that we are really covering a whole data range. We're not doing just smart, a small bit of it, but make sure it's all covered, even if there's like some TBD or etc. included that still needs to be added. It will really help you because you already then know what the missing parts are when you're going to certification or when you're starting your testing and stuff. And also you could write some guidelines, how tos like templates. So how to write the code, how to use the tools in your organization, because usually once you start certifying and the certification process, your team size will increase, increase very much. And we don't want our chief engineer who should really do the technical stuff, uh, working on explaining how we do work uh, to our new co uh, colleagues who are just joining. Um, and then also many companies nowadays are using the agile approaches uh, like Scrum, for example, and you can use those um, stuff that I mentioned here in your definition of done. And even if we think a bit furthermore, then um, there are tools out there that can help you to create your doc uh, documentation with the comments from your code. And that's a good starting point for going into your into your creation of the requirements, which is usually done later. I know the ideal approaches go step by step from top down, but some days ago I talked to a colleague and he said, it seems like projects always start from the code. They done, there's an idea and there's code and you just develop from, from the code. You have to recreate it from the code and that's, that's reality. So with this, we can really make this reality a bit easier for the ones who then have to write the requirements in the end and start this mode of certifiable software and changes to it. So when we are now looking at, is it understandable, recreatable or changeable? We have to say, yeah, maybe with these rules, we're doing a little bit, which is not much really. And it really helps us in the end afterwards with our certifiable software. And also the title of this talk here, it was about so software archeology. span We have to avoid that software archeology. span We don't want to find our Stonehenge and then see, okay, what's it doing and, and, and analyze it and really take much effort into it. Um, from my point of view with that, it's avoided, you're not using, you can avoid software archeology span and it really helps you speed up things. It also helps in the prototyping stage. You're, you will be faster with that. Um, your staff will not be <laughs> thinking about, oh, what did I write down like one month ago? Uh, well, I don't know anymore, I have to retry. And this really takes a lot of time even in, pro in prototyping stage. So that's all. Isn't there more to it? Is there, where's the fancy stuff, you know, like AI, big data, cloud, some connectivity and security, of course, all of those eVTOL aircraft and development need that. And they need algorithms for design for e-motors and charging. And that's really stuff where most of engineers say, okay, well, I really like to work on that. But certification is, what is certification? It's a gated process. It's step-by-step. Step. It's an, continuous improvement approach, it's a structured approach. It's, well, it's possible to use model-based design and object-oriented design and agile methods, of course. You can do that, um, but it's a pretty old approach, really. The DO-178 were created in the 1980s at the beginning. The B version created in 1992, it was around for 20 years, and then it was changed in the, uh, at the beginning of 2009, I think it started in 2012, it was released. I was also part of this working group uh, um, 
working on it. Um, and we could now ask, aren't there, is there really no solution to make it really, really much, much, much easier? So are there any silver bullets you could say? Again, a quote from the Mythical Man Month book. No, there are no silver bullets. There's no one size fits all. There's no thing that really increases productivity by a factor of 10. But in sum, there are many, many things you can do to speed up your certification process. We can help you with that, of course. We can also help you with the fancy stuff above. There's like, for example, EASA roadmap on AI starting. There's another working group about the advancements in software and about low risk operations, how to treat it there. But still the basis from my point, point of view is DU 178 and ED 12, of course, and you, you, have, you have to follow it. So that's it from my side. Um, please contact us if you have any questions, um, our sales guy, our business managers via our website. We are also we have a subsidiary now opened in China. So my Chinese is still in the prototype stage. Uh, I have to work on that. So still there are three, two more words I can say. That's xie uh, xie and zai jie. That's, uh, I hope it's, <laughs> thank you. And goodbye from my side. And I think we're looking into a great future with these aircraft that are up there. It's, it's fantastic. I would love to fly in one of those one day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, Andreas is also the first time at the ePlay Forum. I hope he will come back. Um, and I hope it will be a real forum where now, uh, after the next speaker and between the sessions, we always have nice real tea breaks where we can uh, talk to each other in the direct way, which is quite difficult here. Um, but uh, so one uh, reminder for you, you have all the people and the speakers which are in the uh, call and we are, when if you're in the Zoom call, you can send direct chats, uh, sending your business card as a direct chat and like this uh, connect to each other. On the other hand, you also may contact us, the organizers, and we can put you in contact to the presenters uh, when they have been here on stage. Now, um, we come to the next speaker, um, and it, it's also like um, ITK who supplies for the uh, new upcoming eVTOL industry uh, services to be developed uh, on the software side. Our next uh, speaker, Christian Mundikla from FACC, he uh, is uh, the company uh, is supplying service and I see his uh, presentation is already ramping up. So the company is supplying services for industry for a long time. They are like ITK, they are certified, they have a design organization approval and they are happy to work with manufacturers on this side. So Christian, I think uh, the stage is yours, your mic is unmuted. Um, we still have, uh, we don't see the right screen now. It's not the presentation screen. Now I see, uh, that's better. Now we have the presentation screen and I switch my mic off. Please say a word that I see that your yes. microphone Hello, is there. Perfect, then it's fine and the stage is yours. So Ni Hao from Austria and Xie Xie for inviting me to the eFlight Forum China. It's a big honor for me on behalf of FACC. Welcome to the world of FACC. Again, thanks for the invitation to show you some slides what we are doing here at FACC uh, concerning certification. So the FACC strategy 2030 is committed to the sky at all levels. You know, we are in the aviation industry uh, nearly 40 years now. And uh, we're extending our business uh, to the urban air mobility and aerospace segment. At that stage, thanks to company Ihang for their trust in FACC from the beginning as our first OEM customer in the urban air mobility segment. Really um, big trust in FACC from the first call mid of uh, 2017 uh, to the signature of our contract in uh, October 2018 in Guangzhou. I was there. Personally, it's a big honor for us 
So we, we learned a lot together. Uh, we, are, we try to be a technology partner from the product idea to the customer tailored solution uh, with our three divisions, Aerostructure, Engine Nacelle, and Cabin Interiors. Um, my department, Aftermarket Services, is supporting all three divisions. We have uh, more than 13 locations worldwide. Our headquarter is in Upper Austria, in Ried, where is my office, and I'm sitting today. Um, we are a public company, everything is online, you can study yourself, but just in a snapshot, we have uh, close to 3,000 people, uh, 500 of those are working in R&D, we have more than 300 patents and our research quota is more than 10%, which is unique, at least in Austria. Um, Avic is our main shareholder with 55% and the other shares are treated at the Vienna Stock Exchange. So we are a tier one supplier and represented on almost all modern aircraft. Every second there is an aircraft departing or landing with FSCC on board. Our vision is to fulfill the human desire for mobility in a new, more efficient and sustainable way. I'm a pilot myself, and very passionate about flying. And our mission is we design the future of mobility with the material materials of tomorrow. And we invest a lot in this segment. So why do we get up every day and go to work? Uh, because we have a different perspective. We look at aerospace standards, especially material and processes from a different perspective. And we want to challenge the status quo in order to stay competitive. And we believe in sustainability. So our lightweight products have saved tons of fuels. For example, giving our winglets, which is our logo and our lightweight interior structures. So in, in, a, in a figure, we, we helped to save 43 billion liters of kerosene, which is the equivalent of uh, nine hours of water running down the River Danube in Vienna, just to have a, a picture what our products is contributing to the sustainability and to the CO2 reduction. And we believe in agility and speed. So it's really our culture and DNA, and it's always valued by our customers. And it's also driven by our CEO, Robert Machtlinger, and by the entire management board, an HL organization with short reporting lines. You know all better the potential markets and for sure that the numbers are uh, again too small. I just want to give you an idea where the fo business focus of FSCC is, in the hardware production, in the certification, and all the services around that. In, uh, as well as maintenance. I mean, the, 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 clear grow, the growth is clearly driven by Asia Pacific, especially also China. We want to offer integrated digital solutions along the FSCC value chain, ideally from the beginning to the end and the entire life cycle, from the detailed design, stress analysis, material and process engineering, testing, especially certification, manufacturing, and Finally, aftermarket services about the entire product life cycle. For sure, the materials and processes we use the last 40 years will not meet the requirements in the new segment. So we need fast cur curing resin systems in order to achieve high rate output and production numbers. So therefore, we need low curing temperature compared to standard material in aerospace used up to now. And also new processes out of autoclave processing uh, with uh, flexibility in the curing time. And of course, high performance and low cost materials in focus. So we do a lot to find those materials and the goal is uh, to achieve very short cycle times. And what we ever learn in this new segment of the urban air mobility, we want to also bring back into the uh, aviation and to our aviation customers on the other side. Just an example, uh, our latest investment in, in a new press uh, to achieve uh, the thermoplastic and other uh, processes. So FSCC certification competences, that's all about it. And this is one USB of FSCC. We have a design organization approval uh, since six years now. So we are able uh, to enter into EO, DO arrangements. 
and we have the privilege to do compliance dem demonstration showing and have this experience since more than 30 years. Uh, we also have the privilege of material allow allowable test campaigns and we have a large partner or subcontractor network helping us. So finally, our uh, CVE's competences uh, in analysis, design, testing, and uh, ICAs. So when you look at the certification pyramid, uh, consisting of three pillars, the, the top is the customer certification plan. That's all about around our customer's plan. Uh, to the certification support plan. FSCC created the FSCC quality instruction with the number 116253, including system description, function description, rough certification schedule, including responsibilities, reference to the means of compliance and uh, the qualification test plans, compliance documents and the detailed schedules. Finally, the FSCC means of compliance definition from the method of compliance showing down uh, to the instructions for continued airworthiness. When you look at the certification uh, schedules, you see uh, it's better to talk to us in a very early stage rather than when the product is already finally designed. So it's a, a long process that we want to partner with uh, our customers, for, ideally at the very early stage from the beginning to the type certificate, finally, to the uh, zero production. Um, the benefit or USB of FSCCs, we can do a lot in-house, from the uh, uh, coupons testing up to the components testing, which is a lot more complex when you go up the pyramid. So first of all, at the basis is, you have to look uh, at the requirements that's all about. So what are the requirements concerning stress, concerning weight, and of course, cost to be competitive. And uh, we start from the elements and coupon testing to create database for further projects with a, a big know-how and experience um, in design and, and stress. In our design and stress department, we can uh, test our subcomponents, verify mechanical stress uh, and design features and go up to the um, component level uh, showing compliance. Here's some samples from the uh, coupon testing to the full scale testing in-house at our company Colt, which is also the headquarters in Upper Austria. Uh, and you can see also the uh, different uh, chapters uh, according we are testing the coupons a detailed static fatigue test up to full scale testing. You can see on the right side, uh, Airbus A350 entire winglet. So the winglet and the wing tip. Uh, so we have all that equipment in house. Therefore uh, we are very fast and flexible and independent. We do also flammability and lightning strike tests, uh, but with external partners, example, giving the cowling and nacelle skins we test at the partner institute or the lightning um, protection also externally. All the detailed static tests we do in-house. And we have the environmental testing chamber in-house, also the impact testing we do in-house with a mobile gas gun. And uh, on the left side, you see an example uh, at what we learned and how to protect our components for um, against environmental impacts from, from the ceiling, uh, fillet ceiling for better drainage to primer and top coat and sealant overcoating for fasteners, etc. So in a conclusion, FSCC has more than or close to 40 years experience in aviation. As mentioned, every second there's an aircraft departing with FSCC technology on board. Urban air mobility applications will grow in the future for sure. And FSCC is fully committed from the board to every uh, employee. And we see our role as an integrator and will offer our expertise to all customers in the UM segment, like to EHANG, along the uh, FSCC value chain. Thank you a lot for your attention.
Thank you very much, Christian. Um, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I think I'm unmuted, yes. Um, so yeah, if now the other uh, two speakers uh, would come back, uh, Andreas, if you switch your camera on for the Q&A session, and also Dr. Gao, Dr. Hao, sorry, sorry um, if you would come back on the stage to the microphone. So if we have questions, that we then can ask the questions immediately. And uh, we already have questions here. One question is, ah, thank you for being back. One thing uh, for all the people in the audience uh, in uh, Yang, Yishan, um, please lift, raise your hand if you have a question. We have microphone there, we come to you and you can ask the questions then. Uh, so, uh, so that we get the questions in here. We have some questions already. The first one is uh, for ITK and FACC. Um, uh, what do you think are the important considerations in e-aircraft certification? For ITK, it's software. Uh, for FACC, it's composite components. But um, do you think uh, one of the two is more important. Do you, for example, even Christian, do you think that perhaps the software is the more difficult part or do you think no hardware is the hard part? Uh, so, in personal opinion, I think the software is for sure um, the more complex part, especially when it goes to autonomous flying. Um, so, if you compare it with the automotive uh, autonomous driving level five. I heard a, a number of whatever 100 million uh, code lines um, to be necessary and also to be necessary to certify it compared to whatever 7 million in a, in a single aircraft, for example. So um, I have a big respect uh, from the software, but maybe because of the fact that I'm a mechanical engineer and um, so the mechanics are more familiar to me. Maybe this is a personal opinion. <laughs> so FSC okay. scope, FSCC mm -hmm. scope is clearly aerostructure and interior. So both also interior. Um, and we are partnering uh, in order to offer one-stop shop um, solutions to our customers, partnering in a, in a bigger cluster network, let's say this way. Okay, so Andreas, uh, what's your opinion on uh, this question? What is the what do you think is the most difficult part to get uh, an eVTOL or an electric aircraft in general certified? Well, to get it certified, I think software you can solve it really. If it's autonomous flying, it's a long way. I I agree, but to have, to have it piloted flying, I think that's that's really feasible. Um, I think much more in interesting is the question of, um, is it economical? So do we have a solution that can fly long enough that does not use more energy than necessary? And I think there's really the structures and the weight of the structures and also of course the energy system. So like, um, like the, uh, it's called like 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 batteries and stuff. That's where you need really improvements to get it um, feasible, and that everybody 
accept it. And, and I think that's a longer way than getting the software done. Okay. So now I have a question here for Dr. Howe. Um, does, uh, so, uh, does the uh, CACC also work closely with organizations like EuroK, like ASTM, and are there perhaps similar uh, organizations for uh, harmonization with the manufacturers, for getting the rules in place with the manufacturers? Are there other organizations in Asia which are perhaps for you more important or as important as EuroK and ASTM? Okay, really. Uh, let me uh, use Chinese to answer this question so I can. Uh, sorry. Uh, oh. You also can answer in, in Chinese because we have the simultaneous translation. Uh, is this the case? Uh, you asked about the question about the government. So, I think we have the same question. 期间也有电脑航空史航的委员会在开展相关的工作那么在这个委员会下既有局方的这个审查代表那么也有业界的这些企业也在参与相关的这种标准的制定工作那么也在支持民航局那么服务这个二十三部它的一个审定的这个佛性方法和相关的标准的支撑工作。Okay, thank you very much. Next question I have here would be, or is for Euro K for Sebastian. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are now different standardization organizations like there is Euro K, there is ASTM who has been very strong or in the beginning when it started with the electric motors, uh, the definement ASTM was very active. Um, how does this work? Is there a coordination between ASTM and Euro K or is this more a competition? Like if I as a manufacturer wants to work somewhere, um, would I find the same standards for the same objects uh, for the same uh, areas in both? Or is this more the motors are more on this side, the structure is more on that side? Um, thanks for the question. Um, first of all, yes, a big, a big topic. I think I can speak for all standards development organizations is a global harmonization. We want to have harmonized standards which are applicable cable all over the world and we are coordinating with, with a number of them and i'm sorry can can everybody mute please i have an echo here thanks um it's it's not the not the real uh, competition here we are working together on the same problems um of course it's 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 a bad situation if there are two groups working on a, on the same topics without coordination but we have memorandums of understandings with with almost all of them to ensure that this is uh, avoided so yes we we are working together sometimes different fields of topics are more traditional at the, at the specific organization but in general there's a a, a, an, a huge effort to harmonize globally Okay, thank you. Uh, once again, a reminder, don't hesitate in asking questions in the audience there, lift your hand and uh, then you will receive a microphone. And now um, I continue with, uh, uh, with a question to FACC. Um, what uh, do you think on the structural side uh, is the greatest challenge to getting a prototype certified? or to getting a certified uh, uh, aircraft, which is in, the, uh, uh, to, in, a, in a line of production. Because as I understand it, um, you have done uh, design and construction for parts for airliners. But now we are talking uh, on, uh, on other, I see, I, I see uh, 
Professor, Professor Gao has a question from yeah, the yeah. Chinese side. So perhaps we can have just one quick answer from Christian there, and then you you can ask the question. Uh, yeah, this no, is okay. Yeah. So really, not, not me. Uh, we have our people in uh, our uh, meeting room. They have a question to the speaker. So please come. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. So um, maybe uh, so we we have this. Yeah, but maybe we yeah. have his. Yeah. Answer first, and then Hello. you can answer my question, uh, Christian. Hello, Willy. Uh, I have a question for the for Mr. Sebastian uh, from the uh, Euro K. Uh, I'm your faithful reader of the specification, the regulation. I have a question regarding the your the SC dash veto regulations. I want to ask you guys that uh, how do you handle the power loss situation. When you make the regulation, we know the conventional fixed wing, even the helicopter possesses the the, the glide gliding uh, ability, but it doesn't have that for the veto, right? But when I go through all your regulations, it doesn't mention power loss. Since you assume the veto e veto aircraft will never lose the power. So what's your your concern when making a law? Yes, um, I think in the special condition, there are these two types of, of ETAL aircraft defined, the enhanced and the basic category. And during the enhanced, if you want to certify a VTOL in the enhanced category, there's this no single failure criteria, which means that not a single failure uh, must be the, uh, must reacting to a, a crash of the of the aircraft so i think the power loss is covered in in this specific requirement to be honest um this the really detailed um solution in this yeah, i might i want to refer to the to the experts who really write the standards I'm, I'm the wrong guy here to to talk about the technical details but i know that in the subgroup two in the flight subgroup there's a lot of going on in, in this respect so it's it's a, a complicated topic but I'm, I'm sure we will find a solution here. Yes. Okay, thanks uh, for the answer, Sebastian. And uh, now I repeat my question, which I had for Christian, because FACC has mainly worked in production from airliners, airline or large aircraft, commercial aircraft. There, normally you have uh, not a real mass production like you have in car industry, but if you look at least at some business plans of a lot of retail companies, people are looking at, uh, say, they're talking about mass production of 50,000 pieces of one of these aircraft. So how do you attack this with FACC? Will you have a different approach than on the airline business? Yeah, as I tried to um, present that we are investigating a lot in uh, new processes and new materials in order to achieve the high production rates that are required and requested in this field um, with whatever a thermoplast and fast curing um, materials and um, of course it's more complex uh, to certify an entire vehicle uh, compared to a uh, component but um, i mean the 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 approach itself is always the same and therefore I let me underline again it's it's more easier uh, if we start talking at a very early stage if we start talking together at a very early stage uh, this would be the ideal um, scenario uh, for the certification process of course but uh, um, we have um, already invested a lot in the new materials and processes and we are hiring also uh, people from the automotive uh, and so we can uh, mix our competences um, from the aviation the past 40 years with the uh, competences and experience from uh, new guys we hire. Does this okay. answer your okay. question? Yes, thank you. Uh, and I hope it also answers the, uh, the uh, the, the the thoughts of the person who was sending out the question and um andreas uh, i have a question for you as itk as i learned uh, is, is it's a bosch subsidiary and bosch 
is uh, one of the largest car suppliers for the car industry worldwide. I know ETK is also supplying software for, uh, for cars. So in this point of view, do you have a different approach or is an approach for, let's say, a car standard software which should be certified uh, in, a, in a car for autonomous driving? Is this very similar to what you do on the aviation side or are there very big differences? Well, <laughs> yes, you're right. Um, as ITK, we are working in very different fields, um, not only automotive and aviation, but also, for example, railways or medical equipment, which have also quite strict requirements there. Um, if comparing especially automotive industry and aviation industry, the approach is almost the same. So, um, so in the uh, if in, in the car industry we have this ISO 26262 document which we have to apply which is from the basic idea really similar to DO 178 or ED 12 and the other documents as well. The main difference we see is that for aviation you really have a, a an authority in the end that does much stricter audits and much more tougher checking than uh, any TÜV in the um, car industry is doing. And I think it's quite reasonable because for a car, we always have a safe state of stopping, except for very, very few, um, let's say, phases where it's really dangerous for a car to stop, for example, when you're crossing a railway. But um, for, for, a, for, an, for an aircraft, you're always, you're supposed to fly and you're in the air, you don't have a safe state there. So you need to make sure that your fallback system works and all that stuff. So in essential, it's quite similar, but with the, um, the documents are a bit different, that's all. And the main difference is really the authorities who are looking at your documents because at TÜV you have to to pay it well you have to pay the authority as well but you can change your TÜV if you don't like it for the authority in, av in aviation you can't really ch change it okay thanks uh, for this answer i would have uh, another question to dr howe uh, which is on uh, the Chinese uh, certification, which is planned now. As I heard, there is first uh, a stage where right now you have allowed unmanned uh, drones to fly in a, in a kind of test phase. Um, and for manned flying, Will this be similar, that aircraft will be able to fly in a test phase without a type certificate? And then later you will define the type certificate or will there be a type certificate coming up soon for the eVTOL, a little bit like the SC VTOL of EASA? Uh, well, 呃，我了解到的一些情况，但是可能不能代表呃，CAC去呃呃做一个这种政策性的一个呃表述。那么我了解到的情况是，呃，现在确实CAC在呃有呃启动关于这个呃实验区啊，那么这样的一个工作，那
Christian because I uh, you say uh, you, uh, or it was in the media that FACC is uh, uh, working together with Ehang to support them in certification. Um, what about uh, you know? And now you're looking for uh, for different other uh, eVTOL manufacturers to collaborate. Will this be difficult, or do you think it, it will be easy to work with different and to keep their and to keep their intellectual property? Because I think that's a big fear of a lot of the small uh, eVTOL company. If I now have a small startup, I have a new eVTOL, I get my funding, and then if I go to a big company and say, so "See, ah, they are already working with this and this and this competitor competitor company," um, how would this work? Do you're uh, you're muted still yeah. okay yeah. so um i would say we have enough experience from in the last 40 years um uh, working for different uh aviation oems like uh, airbus boeing in the business chat bombardier embraer uh, all the um, engine manufacturers whatever uh, rolls royce uh, pratt and whitney and general electrics um and so on. So we have experience to um, separate teams in separate o separate offices with firewalls, etc. So um, we are used uh, to that um, work working scheme. So for us, it, it's not something different. It's uh, the same as we did the last forty years. Um, so <laughs> maybe you have to ask. Um, potential new customers. So I, from our point of view, we are experienced uh, working like that, uh, like Magna in the automotive world, uh, working for different car manufacturers. Uh, FSCC is working in the aviation for different OEM customers with very strict NDAs and, and, and contracts. So we are used to that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I would say we have one last question and then we have to wrap up here and go to the next session. Um, the last question would be to Euro K, um, like uh, it's called like in the name, like you have Euro K. So is your work really based mainly on Europe or are you also working very strongly with uh, other uh, um, authorities in other countries like, uh, let's say, Brazilian, uh, uh, United States or China? Yes, yes. So the name is EuroK. That if we are a European-based organization, but it's an, our scope is international. So we oh, are, uh, as shown on my slides, we are working together with partner SDOs in the US. We are working together with regulators from all over the world uh, so we are definitely not limited to europe or the eu we are an international organizations and our documents are referenced worldwide i think even fa etc they're all referencing to our documents and maybe a word also if we have a joint activity for example with rtca in the us we're doing quite a lot so all of the documents are published on the rtca and the euro side they would receive individual numbering according to the organizations, but the document is identical. So uh, we ensure here also the, the, the harmonization on both sides uh, to, be, to make it short, yes, we, we are working internationally. Okay, thank you very much. I just heard there is another question on site. Uh, I heard Lulu that there is one question. So could you either ask the question or um, let the person come to the microphone. Hi, um, can, can you hear yes. Me? Yeah. Um, yes, I so hear you. Have, uh, thank you. Um, I have a question for um, Anders from ITK. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, so uh, I, my question is that um, I heard you said that um, you mentioned that um, DO 178 is a very old uh, requirement for software, and uh, there's no silver bullet for the certification. Um, but there's a way that you can help us to make it faster. Could you give us some, some like guidelines and uh, share with us some uh, some of your practices in other places? That's how you make this happen. 
Thank you. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so as I said in my slide, I put some information there for documentation. There is much more to it. Um, for example, um, things that could help you really in the beginning is um, when you're looking only at software code, it's coding standard checker tools. So you have tools that check your guidelines. If you select those tools, try to select a tool that is really, that is being used already in certification projects. Um, you know, the authorities, they, um, it's much easier for someone who's checking your project to accept the approach you're taking if there's evidence already that it has been used in an already certified project. So if there are different tools there. If you pick one that's totally new on the market, you will have loads of effort with the tool qualification maybe that you need to do. If you take a standard tool, then they even can provide to you all these evidences as well in a certification package. This really helps a lot, but um, for certification package, you also have to check very closely, does it really match your needs or are there many things you need to add on this side? Um, some other aspects, if you're looking at the end of a certification project, for example, you need to have to make sure you have these processes in place for your open PR assessment and for your change control board meetings, because your most important people will be hooked up there and you need to have your process for baselining in place. You can check that upfront and make sure it's, it's working, it's, it's feasible, the people need to know what they are doing. This, this can really speed things up for you there and same thing always in the requirements and so on you just um, try to get some people on board who who know that stuff already who've done it before you have some templates on board that can make stuff for you easier um, if looking back on the on the question for the for the software is software really an issue in the future i think there are two aspects um, one thing is the process and the other one is the content of the software. If we are trying to use new algorithm and stuff, then we, then that's a really a big thing. But the process itself, it's static, it's, it's fixed. Um, we can use some approaches as common off the shelf software and try to get those in or even open source so software. But it always, you need to look pretty closely if this really helps you and fits your, fits your needs. And also, for example, you could use model-based development approaches. There are tools out there who support code generation, but it depends on what software you're developing. If it's in control algorithm, and this is most of, of your software, it can help you. But if you're doing like bus communication, then this modeling approach is sometimes not really fit. So it depends on what you're doing, but this, these are some examples um, that can help you as well. I hope this helps you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all the speakers in this session. I think certification is like we also heard in the session before, it's an important issue. So um, uh, stay tuned. We will also in future events always have an eye on what are the things for certification, what are the things for supply chain, man uh, supply chain management. So thank you all here. And we go over to the next session. And the next session is about hydrogen aviation, where we have... How can you get eFlight Journal? Just scan the QR code on this page. Or just type in your browser www.eflightjournal.com Then you receive the page with the latest online news on electric flying, EV tolls and everything which is connected with electric mobility in the air or you can click the link on the top and then you go to the latest PDF version which you either can read in the Yumpu reader directly on your screen 
like a conventional magazine or you can go and download the magazine as PDF file so that you can read it offline wherever you want. Thanks for watching and goodbye.